Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Behringer Ingelheim. This program is presented by Medscape Education Global. Greetings. I am Dr. Javed Butler, Professor and Chairman of the Department of Medicine at the University of Mississippi in Jackson, Mississippi and I'm delighted to present on the topic, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is arguably the greatest unmet need in cardiology, the potential role of SGLT2 inhibitors. So let's start by talking a little bit about the epidemiology of heart failure in general, and then let's focus a little bit on epidemiology, presentation, diagnosis, and uh, some of the therapeutic aspects related to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in light of the outcomes of these patients. The epidemiology of heart failure overall is not only a significant concern, but it's a growing concern in the United States. About 6.5 million Americans have heart failure. The prevalence of heart failure is increasing in part related to the aging of the population. The outcomes for these patients remain substantially poor. We are talking about a 40 to 50 percent five-year mortality after the diagnosis of heart failure in these patients. These patients are at a particularly higher risk of hospitalizations and recurrent hospitalizations. And finally, they have substantially reduced quality of life as well. And this is not a problem which is limited to the United States. This is a global problem. If you look at the epidemiology, whether it is in Europe, whether it is in Asia, South America, Africa, wherever you look at it, we're looking at similar uh, prevalence trends in the population as well as the incidence trends, uh, though in some countries it is even higher, but there are no regions of the world where heart failure is not a growing problem. Now, when it comes to the definition of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, there are some issues, right? Because we are talking about diagnosing a disease on the basis of preserved or normal function, not necessarily an abnormal function. So defining abnormality is much easier. And therefore, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction uh, have uniformly been defined as, uh, as in clinical trials as uh, EF less than 40%. But we know that ejection fraction greater than 40% is not necessarily normal ejection fraction. Therefore, the term preserved ejection fraction is used, but we also know that the, the real normal ejection fraction is greater than 50 to 55%. So if you look at how uh, the different organizations, uh, American, uh, European, Japanese, how they have dealt with the, the designation of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, there are these subtle differences uh, in those sort of the intermediate mid-range ejection fraction between 40 and 50 and greater than 50 percent. Uh, and these subtle differences, though they might be subtle, uh, do lead to some difficulties in comparing outcomes across uh, different uh, trials and, and, and across different research. And therefore, these three organizations within the United States, the Heart Failure Society of America, the ESC Heart Failure Association, and the Japanese Heart Failure Association recently came up with a universal definition document uh, for heart failure, and they defined heart failure with ejection fraction less than or equal to 40% as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And then you have the mid range between 41 and 49. Uh, and anybody who has heart failure syndrome with an ejection fraction of equal to or greater than 50% is defined as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And they also make this distinction that if your ejection fraction used to be low, but now has improved, this is termed as heart failure with improved ejection fraction. Now, of all the people, I showed you some global data uh, in terms of the prevalence trends of patients with heart failure, 
uh, that was in general. So what about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction overall? Well, if you look at the studies so far, it turns out that heart failure with preserved ejection fraction accounts for almost 50% of overall heart failure. So this is not something uh, which is a niche diagnosis. It is a very common a diagnosis both in epidemiologic studies and, and uh, cohort studies, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction accounts for almost half of all the heart failure burden. But unfortunately, that trend is getting even worse. And the indications are that over time, the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction prevalence will supersede heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Some of those trends are already being seen among hospitalized heart failure patients currently but over time, within the next decade or so, uh, the epidemiologic significance of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction will become more so than heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So why is that? Why is the prevalence of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction increasing? Well, there are several reasons for this. One uh, is that people are aging, and along with aging, you have decline in other organ system function, more hypertension effects over time. Uh, more renal dysfunction. So heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is sort of part and parcel uh, of the aging process as well. So that's one reason. Two, the prevalence of comorbidities that lend themselves at higher risk of developing heart failure are also increasing. Obesity, diabetes, uh, 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 metabolic abnormalities, uh, hypertension, uh, uh, dyslipidemia, so this sort of milieu in which people develop heart failure renal dysfunction, that those comorbidities are also increasing. And finally, um, perhaps because the sign symptoms of heart failure are non-specific, a lot of the heart failure uh, with preserved ejection fraction may be just remain undiagnosed. But now, uh, with better appreciation of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, perhaps the screening and diagnosis at the community level is also increasing. So there are multiple reasons because of which the epidemiologic trend for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is worsening. Now, the reason why diagnosis of heart failure is so difficult, because if you think about it, your ejection fraction is normal or near normal. So you're uh, uh, relying primarily on symptoms. And these symptoms like shortness of breath, fatigue, tiredness, I mean, these are, you know, edema. Uh, these are non-specific symptoms and can occur in a whole host of other abnormalities as well. Now, the problem here is that appropriately so, when patients uh, develop these symptoms, the clinicians assess for all the other differential diagnoses, whether it is lung disorder, anemia, thyroid problems. The problem is that after ruling those sort of uh, things, traditionally we have not gone ahead and evaluated for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. We kind of blame it on aging, we kind of blame it on obesity, uh, despite the fact that perhaps, say, six months ago, the patients did not have these symptoms and they were sort of equally old or equally overweight. And we don't necessarily do the next level evaluation for these patients. So when heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is primarily diagnosed in the emergency room setting or mostly diagnosed in the emergency room setting, it's because it, the diagnosis has been missed in the outpatient setting and the patient goes into extremism and come, uh, come to the hospital. There have been these uh, scores like uh, H2 uh, uh, FF score uh, by colleagues from the Mayo Clinic that sort of tries to put some of these comorbidities and some of these changes in the cardiac structure function in perspective into the score uh, of uh, uh, how you should suspect somebody with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in the clinical setting. And as these uh, uh, the scores accumulate, the risk of heart failure goes up. But at the end of the day, Clinicians rely on echocardiography for the diagnosis of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Now, remember, ejection fraction is normal, right? I mean, that, that's the, by definition, is uh, uh, greater than 50%. So, we had this notion in the past uh, that these patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction had big LVH, a small cavity, diastolic dysfunction with restrictive filling, left atrial abnormalities. And all of those things are true. All of those things are true, but are not mandatory. In other words, there's a lot of people with the syndrome of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction that may not have evident these echocardiographic abnormalities. So when they have it in the appropriate uh, uh, context of signs and symptoms, they have a good positive rate of value. But if, they are, if their patients don't have these uh, uh, structural abnormalities or functional cardiac abnormalities,
that does not rule out the possibility. So then we move on to natriuretic peptides. So natriuretic peptide again have really revolutionized the way we think about heart failure. Uh, but in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, there are some limitations. One, very much like ECHO, I think that screening these patients with natriuretic peptide is a great idea because if your natriuretic peptide levels are elevated in the appropriate setting of uh, signs and symptoms consistent with heart failure, you got your diagnosis, right? You have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The, pro the problem or the issue is that patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction tend to have lower uh, natriuretic peptides than heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And the reason for that is that the natriuretic peptides are related to stress on the ventricular wall. Patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction have dilated ventricular wall, and by the Laplace formula, the bigger the diameter, the more the stress on the LV wall, the higher the NP level. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction patients have a smaller ventricular cavity, less uh, stress on the ventricular wall, and they have lower natriuretic peptide levels. Also, patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction tends to be more obese. And adiposity, visceral adiposity, those people who are obese uh, tend to have lower natriuretic peptide levels as well because of these two. Having said that, I want to re repeat a couple of things. One is that if the natriuretic peptide levels are elevated, they are very useful for the diagnosis of heart failure. And even in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction patients, natriuretic peptides are prognostic. But Finally, at the end of the day, if you have a person who's really symptomatic, the echocardiography or natriuretic peptides are not necessarily giving you the diagnosis. I would say that that will occur in a minority of patients, but you will see some patients uh, uh, where, where this, this is a, a conundrum and none of these other diagnoses uh, have panned out like anemia or thyroid dysfunction or, 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 or lung problem. Uh, refer that patient to a, a specialist uh, advanced heart failure uh, 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 Position uh, because on right heart catheterization, elevated uh, hemodynamics either at rest or uh, with exercise can help you with that diagnosis. Now, what about the outcomes for these patients? So, we made a case that this is a growing prevalent condition, but a growing prevalent condition does not necessarily mean that it is clinically important. Maybe the outcome for these patients are really good. Unfortunately, not so. The outcome for these patients are equally bad as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, at least in the observational study. In the clinical trials, we have seen that the outcomes for hep F patients are better than heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And mostly, we, we think it is because of the inclusion exclusion criteria, and we tend to take less sick patients than in the community setting that are older or with more advanced renal dysfunction, uh, et cetera. But if you look at the observational, large observational study, the outcomes of patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction is equally bad as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction in terms of the risk for mortality and the risk for hospitalization. What is different, though, is that while the risk of mortality is comparable between heart failure with reduced and preserved ejection fraction, the cause of mortality, the composition of mortality, is a little bit different. In heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, the majority, 80 plus percent of the deaths occur because of cardiovascular causes. And within cardiovascular causes, the primarily uh, the mortality is related to sudden cardiac death or progressive pump failure. When we come to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, a large proportion, a larger proportion of mortality is related to non-cardiovascular comorbid conditions. And within the cardiovascular, it's a bigger array of cardiovascular causes, not just progressive pump failure or sudden cardiac death. Not only the quality, not, not only the mortality morbidity outcomes, but the quality of life outcomes, functional capacity, disability, shortness of breath, symptoms, quality of life, all of these things are also substantially reduced in patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. So we have a disease with very prevalent uh, epidemiology, worsening prevalent epidemiology, global uh, uh, worsening trends, and uh, uh, outcomes which are comparable to heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. But we know that in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction over the past two to three years, we have made big advances in terms of improving
improvement of the outcome for these patients, multiple therapies, drugs, devices that improve the outcome. What about with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction? Unfortunately, that is not the case. If you look at the clinical trials in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, they have been largely neutral. Uh, no improvement in outcomes overall. Some of the trials uh, showed some benefit uh, in certain subgroups, but all in all, we have not seen the benefit uh, uh, in the clinical trial setting with various different therapies. Now, there has been a lot said about the TopCat trial of patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction that tested uh, espironolactone in these patients. It made a lot of sense to test espironolactone uh, because of its antifibrotic effects, because of its uh, natriuretic peptide, natriuresis effect, although the doses that we use are not particularly natriuretic. But nevertheless, it made sense. The overall trial was neutral, did not show improvement in outcomes for mortality, but there was improvement in hospitalization and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. What we did, however, find uh, found out in this trial was that there was substantial regional variation, substantial regional variation in this trial. Those patients that were enrolled in the Americas showed a distinct benefit with the use of phenolactone, whereas those patients that were enrolled in other regions of the world, like Russia and Ukraine did not, uh, and Georgia, did not show benefit. Uh, there has been a lot written about it. Uh, uh, we can all uh, uh, have our own opinion. Uh, there were issues in terms of the absolute outcomes as they seen here were much better. So that raises the question whether the patients even had heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Then there were some data that came out uh, that the urinary, uh, uh, sorry, the serum cannabinone levels were not elevated. So then the question is, were the patients compliant and taking the medications? So we don't know, but by and large, overall, the trial did show improvement in hospitalization rate. There was this regional heterogeneity. A lot of the uh, physicians believe that this drug is beneficial. It does have an indication, a class two indication for hospitalization, but these data are strong enough that now there are at least two ongoing trials looking at MRAs in patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. We'll see what the data shows. What about some of the other trials? Uh, so we have seen some post-talk analysis and some meta-analysis with beta blockers showing trend uh, in relatively preserved ejection fraction, not necessarily normal. And then in the CHARM program, we also saw that this intermediate range ejection fraction between 40 to 50%, 55%, there was benefit uh, that was seen as well. We do know that candesartinib also has an indication in the US guidelines of the class two indication for improvement in hospitalization rate. Where there is a lot of interest now is with the uh, RNA agents and receptor nephrolysis inhibitor of Valsartan and Sucubitril. There was a large trial done in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And what we saw in that trial, that overall, the primary endpoint of cardiovascular death, heart failure hospitalization, narrowly missed its key value. Key value was 0.059. There was a 13% overall reduction. If you look at hospitalization by itself, again, a very strong trend, just narrowly missed its key value. But then there was a pre-specified analysis looking at the median ejection fraction, which in this trial turned out to be 57%. And it looks like those patients with that, with, uh, who had an EF of less than 57%, there was a statistically significant improvement in outcomes, whereas those that had an ejection fraction greater than 50% showed no benefits. So that further intensified this issue of the definition of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction versus a mildly reduced or mid-range. So I showed you some universal definitions that recently came out. But actually, the, the, the regulators, the FDA, did change the indication for Valsartan and Sucubitril uh, from exclusively being for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction to now what it said is that this drug is indicated to reduce the risk of cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart for, for patients with chronic heart failure. Benefits are most clearly evident in patients with left ventricular ejection fraction below normal. So, so this ejection fraction less than 57% seems to be benefiting with this drug. What do the guidelines say for the management of these patients? Well, the US guidelines. Uh, the last full set of guidelines came out in 2013. Basically, the focus is on congestion and comorbidity management. And as I said, there are class two indications uh, for candesartan and uh, esternolactone. The European guidelines came out in 2016. 
So uh, again, five years old, uh, and basically says the same thing about management of comorbidities uh, and congestion, things like ischemia, blood pressure, hypertension, diabetes, uh, atrial uh, fibrillation. Both these guidelines came prior to the Paragon trial and the ARNI updated uh, uh, indication that I went through. Having said that, both the guidelines are being updated and we'll get some data regarding that pretty soon. So now let's turn our focus a little bit on the pathophysiology and the comorbidity of uh, burden in patients with heart failure and preserve ejection fraction. Now comorbidities are common in patients with heart failure and reduce ejection fraction, but they tend to be even more prevalent. The oral comorbidity burden, uh, things like diabetes and atrial fibrillation and obesity and chronic kidney disease, these are very common in patients with heart failure and preserve ejection fraction. One other distinction is that these comorbidities are not just sort of parallel comorbidities occurring in patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. They are pathophysiologically linked intricately with the development and progression of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction because underlying these various different uh, organ system uh, uh, malfunction is a common theme of inflammation, oxidative stress, uh, which is related uh, to development of vascular dysfunction, uh, uh, endothelial dysfunction, insulin resistance, and all of these things can lead to various different organ dysfunction manifesting as various different diseases. If we think about the pathophysiology of heart failure, uh, we know that pathophysiology of heart failure is multifaceted. There are abnormalities in the vascular system, there are abnormalities in the cardiac structure and function, and there are abnormalities of congestion as well in these patients. So there are multi-organ system abnormalities that are seen in patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. And actually, one of the interesting things about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, our best understanding today, is that heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is a disease that starts with the heart and goes out into the periphery. So whatever the reason is, whether it is a myocardial infarction, a chemotherapy uh, related cardiac dysfunction, myocarditis, whatever it is, there's an initial drop in the cardiac function. And that decrease in the ejection fraction then leads to systemic chemodynamic abnormalities, neurohormonal activation, which then leads to secondary abnormalities, for instance, worsening kidney function, uh, skeletal muscle dysfunction, so on and so forth, and you develop symptoms. Now, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction likely goes in the opposite direction, but the abnormalities are first in the periphery and they come into the heart, leading to abnormalities in the cardiac structure uh, and function. So what happens is that you have this cardiometabolic milieu, adiposity-related inflammation, and oxidative stress, insulin resistance, all of these things lead to abnormalities in nitric oxide, CGMP, PKG signaling pathway, endothelial dysfunction. Remember that the endothelium is prevalent across all uh, organ systems because endothelium is on the blood vessels and all the organs are uh, receiving blood supply. So this endothelial dysfunction especially have a profound effect uh, on the aortic and the cardiac structure and functions. You develop aortic stiffness, uh, you develop left ventricular hypertrophy, diastolic dysfunction, uh, then also you have abnormalities in energy metabolism, ATP production, and this complex then all leads to development of uh, uh, cardiac abnormalities. Now, part of these uh, cardiac abnormalities may turn into the syndrome of heart failure. Part of these may remain relatively silent, but when you add on top of that renal dysfunction, when you add on top of that renal dysfunction and sodium and fluid retention, uh, you tip into the syndrome of heart failure. And of course, renal dysfunction is also intricately related to this cardiometabolic insulin resistant uh, uh, milieu uh, as well. One very interesting thing is that patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction get congested. They retain sodium and fluid. Why do they retain sodium and fluid? That is because of neurohormonal uh, activation. However, the neurohormonal activation is not very profound in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. 
the median GFR in these patients is about 60. So sure, if your GFR is 20 and you're retaining sodium and fluid, that makes sense. But why do patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction whose GFR is say 55, 60, 65, why are they retaining sodium and fluid in the absence of neurohormonal activation, which then leads to the, uh, the hypothesis that perhaps part of this syndrome is driven primarily because of the renal dysfunction and higher sodium and fluid ability by itself. Uh, this may again be related to this common pathophysiology of insulin resistance and uh, 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 oxidative stress and, and inflammatory state. And part of this may also be uh, explain the relationship uh, between hypertension and racial disparities and increased sodium and fluid retention. Uh, we know that the worsening kidney function is associated almost linearly with the increased risk of developing of heart failure. And while this was not a treatment for heart failure trial, we do know that trohalidone is associated with substantial reduction in the risk of new onset heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. We also showed some data with spironolactone therapy. And again, the doses of spironolactone that we used in this trial were not particularly natriuretic. But this whole idea of drugs that affect the renal function and potential for natriuresis does seem to have some beneficial effect. So if that is the case, then that really brings us into uh, thinking about the potential role of STLT2 inhibitors in patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. These are some of the data from the EMPA-REC outcomes trial. This has now been shown with multiple cardiovascular outcomes trials with different SGLT2 inhibitors that STLT2 inhibitors have a beneficial effect of preservation of renal function whether it is preservation in terms of albuminuria or the slope of GFR, the decline of GFR that is substantially preserved in patients with uh, uh, diabetes. And now there are some data coming out, even patients without diabetes, uh, there is preservation of renal function over time. What is also interesting is that this preservation of renal function seems to be across the GFR range. So these drugs are associated with reduction in hard renal events, things like need for renal uh, transplantation, need for dialysis, need for, uh, uh, the risk for renal death. But these are end organ manifestations that occur in a minority of patients. The more interesting aspect is preservation of renal function, even when your renal function at baseline is not normal, but relatively preserved. Your GFR is 60, 70, 80. Even in those patients we are seeing, preservation of renal function. What is also interesting is that heart failure, uh, that uh, uh, patients with diabetes are at a higher risk of developing heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, more so than heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And SGLT2 inhibitor substantially reduces the risk of heart failure hospitalization in patients who have diabetes, even in the absence of history of heart failure. In other words, they prevent heart failure. So if you were to put all of these things together between preservation of renal function, reduction in the risk of hospitalization for heart failure and the impact of renal function, uh, one can start hypothesizing that perhaps SGLT2 inhibitors may be beneficial in patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction, but more so the pharmacodynamic effect of uh, SGLT2 inhibitors is really broad. So it doesn't matter which hypothesis of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction you believe in, whether you believe in aortic stiffness and endothelial dysfunction and the ventricular vascular uncoupling issue, whether you believe in diastolic dysfunction, left ventricular hypertrophy, atrial dysfunction, whether you believe in sodium avidity, renal dysfunction uh, uh, hypothesis, or you believe in this general comorbidity, insulin resistant, oxidative stress related multi organ dysfunction. Actually, it doesn't matter which hypothesis you believe in, the promise of SGLT2 inhibitors still stays because SGLT2 inhibitors are associated with, with significant beneficial effects on all of these organ systems. They preserve renal function they, because of both osmotic diuresis and blocking of sodium hydrogen exchange receptor. They have 
diuretic effect and diuretic effect. By decreasing adiposity, they have all of these secondary beneficial effects in terms of oxidative stress, inflammation, and secondary neurohormonal activation. The perinephric epicardiac fat reduction may have beneficial effects directly on organ function. And because of these, there are data either in animal or in human showing beneficial effects on aortic stiffness, endothelial dysfunction, left ventricular reverse uh, remodeling, energy metabolism, ATP production, uh, uh, and then there are some more novel mechanisms like improved lysosomal function and autophagy, and one can go on and on, but the composite uh, beneficial effect of these drugs uh, uh, really affects all the pathophysiologic pathways of heart failure with preserving the extra fraction that we understand today. So indeed, there are two trials ongoing in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction patients right now. One is emperor preserved in patients with heart failure uh, and preserved ejection fraction EF of greater than 40% with the drug empagliflozin, and another large outcome trial with dapagliflozin in similar patient population. We are hoping that both of these trials uh, will complete and will have the results out within the next year or so. So we look forward to the results of these two large trials, particularly so because there is a good theoretical benefit uh, uh, for pathophysiology uh, of HFAB with the SGLB2 inhibitors. And so far, the mechanistic data are also very optimistic. So to summarize, Patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction account for about 50% of heart failure uh, uh, epidemiology out there. The prevalence incidence continues to increase in part related to aging and in part related to increasing comorbidity burden. The outcome for these patients, both morbidity mortality as well as functional capacity and quality of life is as bad as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. We have seen some data coming out showing potential benefit with RDs. Right now, the guidelines primarily focus on congestion management and on management of comorbidities. These guidelines will be updated soon, and we will see uh, what the guidelines say. But in the meantime, we have two large straws of SGLT2 inhibitors that are about to complete. We will see the data, lots of interest. And if these straws are positive, they have the potential to change the landscape on how we manage patients with heart failure and preserve ejection fraction. Appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and I hope this was of benefit. Thank you. This program was presented by Medscape Education Global.